Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Esper. I'm a fourth year PhD student here in computer science at UCSD, um, being advised by Bill Griswold and Beth Simon. And it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Joab Freund. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background. Um, you can also find some information um, online on the program. Um, but Joab is, uh, sorry, Dr. Freund is um, known for his work with uh, Dr. Shapiri on the Adaboost algorithm. And for this work, they were awarded two awards, one in 2003, the Girdle Award, and one in 2004, the Kenalakis Award. Um, in 2008, he was elected as a AAAI Fellow, and he is still a professor here in machine learning um, at the Computer Science Department. He's interested in big data analytics and online education. And today, he will be speaking about replacing the question, can computers be intelligent with can machines be conscious? So again, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Freund. Um, this is going to be part uh, just uh, ruminations about where is artificial intelligence and where we're going, and then at the end, some of what I think are the big achievements of what I would call intelligence amplification. Um, so let's start. Okay, so... Um, 1996, 1997, there were two matches between um, uh, Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue, and uh, they went like this. Uh, the first match on February 96, Kasparov wins 4 to 2. The second match, May 1997, Deep Blue wins 3.5 um, uh, to 2.5. And, and that was a huge event. That was basically the first time that, uh, that uh, computer won against um, a world champion in standard um, um, configuration, in standard match setup. It's interesting to look at what actually happened in a little bit more detail. So in the first um, match, Kasparov initially lost. The first game of the first match, Kasparov lost. He was not really very much phased with that, but uh, then he went on to win the second match, and there were two uh, matches that, that were a draw, and then um, Kasparov won two games decisively, and that was it, basically. Kasparov won. In the second time, things were kind of opposite. First game, Kasparov won. Second game, Deep Blue won. Then there were three draws, and then in the last game, uh, Deep Blue won to win the match. And uh, people ask, like, what, what happened? I mean, what, how, what was the big thing? It was a very emotional thing for Kasparov. And he very much pointed to this game, the, ge the first game in which he actually won. So why was he um, so upset with it? This is... Uh, some text I found about the game, game one in the 1997 match. Deep Blue's 44th move on this game puzzled Kasparov, and he attributed to superior intelligence. Um, allegedly, the move was a result of a bug in which Deep Blue, unable to determine desirable move, resorted to a failsafe. Nate Silver proposes that Kasparov concluded the counterintuitive play must be a sign of superior intelligence, leading him to lose the second game, okay, and to lose the whole match. So this is interesting, right? Because basically, that I wrote on top, to air is human. So basically, Kasparov was really thrown off by that step. That was not a rational step. It was not a good step. It was actually, the, the game was lost. I mean, the... the but it was so outside of what Kasparov was expecting that it basically uh, caused him emotional turmoil and he couldn't, he couldn't really maintain his superiority. So here's the sad story of AI. Uh, this is something I've, learned, I've heard when I started. Uh, <laughs> Artificial intelligence is a very promising field. It has been a very promising, making many promises for the last 50 years. Um, 
I would say that it's a little bit different. I would say that when AI promise has been fulfilled, it is no longer AI. So when a computer can win against Kasparov, well, that was just brute force. When, um, um, when, when uh, we have now Siri that can recognize uh, what we're saying, well, it just does it in very restricted setups. So here are examples. Uh, DARPA, the urban challenge, where cars can drive in cities. Uh, Google Translate, which is amazingly good. IBM's Watson, uh, Siri, and many others. So I think it's kind of like a little bit of the reverse joke. Um, you know the joke where um, somebody sees all of these arrows right in the middle of the bullseye and he asks, how is that done? And say, well, it's easy. I just shoot the arrow and then I draw the bullseye. And in artificial intelligence, it's the opposite. People say, okay, this is what we need to do. Then we finally do it and then they say, no, no, this is not what we need to do. Okay, so it comes to back to Turing test, right? So everybody kind of knows about the Turing test, but surprisingly, if you go to the original text, it is a little different than what you think. In the original text, in the first part, there is no computer at all. There is a man that tries to imitate a woman, and then there is a woman that tries to help the interrogator see uh, that she is the, the woman, and the other one is uh, just a man. Okay, and the interrogator, which Turing says can be a man or a woman, um, is trying to decide that. And in order to not be biased by voice nuances and the way people look, they said, let's connect them through computers. Okay, and then once that is settled, then Turing says, okay, what about replacing the man with a computer? And so really the question is, can a man, can a, a computer imitate a woman, not can a computer imitate a man. <laughs> a man is easy. <laughs> so, um, so to other, talk about other games, we're actually very, com very, um, very used to games of, of like comparing computers to people, which is the CAPTCHA game, right? So a computer is trying to register to a website Humans are trying to register to the website, and there's another computer, now the judge is a computer, that basically um, tries to distinguish, is this a human or is this a computer? Okay, so, and uh, seems to be doing a pretty, pretty good job uh, distinguishing. This is uh, one of my favorite uh, signs. This is, uh, you know, you get a captcha, and, uh, and it says, don't type. So what do you do? This is, uh, I think, one of another use of the diagonalization argument that I like. Okay, so, so I would say that there is a lot of emotional stuff going on behind the Turing test that has nothing to do really with logic and so on. Gender discrimination is compared with discrimination between man and machine. That's not something I thought about. In the 50s atmosphere, one might expect that, that the, the example would be of a woman imitating a man rather than the other way around. But Turing is believed to be a closeted homosexual, so maybe he's trying to actually put somebody else there. And it basically plays on our fear of the other. It's not, it's not really the computer there. It's like it might be man versus woman or some other thing. And our guards are up when we're faced with close imitations of ourselves. We just really don't like it. This is a very fundamental thing inside us. So this um, thing that is inside us is very well known in people that work on uh, animation. It's called the uncanny valley. Basically, it me it, what it is that uh, if you have a stick figure or the Simpsons, um, they are so clearly not real humans, that we feel it's easy for us, <laughs> it's easy for us to emphasize, uh, empathize with them. When it gets more uh, realistic, um, when we get pretty close to being actually realistic, there is this uncanny valley. So uncanny valley is basically this big danger that people that try to do hyper-realistic animation are always facing, 
which is that in a subconscious way, when we see something that is almost like us, we really, really resent it. And here's an example. So basically, the, the, the Polar Express is one movie that is known to have suffered from this problem. And then there is this uh, thing I haven't learned, didn't know about before, Kubo Girl. It's just uh, it's a website, and I'll show it to you now. So this is basically Kubo Girl. It's an animation. See the mouse? I can move the mouse, and she reacts to the mouse. Oh, the video is not very smooth, so that's actually the main problem. Uh, the, the, when you, if you go to that website, just Google on it and go to it, the, it's, the, the response is is magnificent, is really, really good. And it looks good in kind of an eerie way. So, so that's kind of what I mean. It's basically, it's just too close for comfort. Okay, so talking about the too close for comfort, one of the main arguments in the debate about artificial intelligence is the Chinese room paradox by John Searle, 1999. Basically, it uh, goes something like this. John does not know Chinese. John sits in a room. He gets his input a question written in Chinese. He follows an algorithm that he is given to generate the answer in Chinese. Can we say that the room understands Chinese? So Cyril says, obviously not. Of course. It doesn't understand Chinese. And I just ask, why not? I mean, in what sense not? Not in the real human way, I guess, but understanding Chinese is something you can measure. OK, so that kind of leads to this whole region that, of discomfort called uh, um, strong AI requires human traits. So for instance, so if you just go to Wikipedia and talk about strong AI, of the kind we're talking about, uh, there's sentience. So that's the ability to feel, perceive, or experience subjectively. Sapience, wisdom or judgment. Self-awareness, which is introspection. And ability to identify self as separate from environment. And consciousness is basically all of the above. It's kind of the whole package. So this is one of my very favorite uh, quotes about consciousness uh, by Nietzsche. And what he says, I'll just read it. Consciousness is the last and latest development of the organic, and hence also what is most unfinished and unstrong. Consciousness gives rise to countless errors that lead an animal or man to perish sooner than necessary. If the conserving association of the instincts were not so much more powerful, and if it did not serve on the whole as a regulator, humanity would have to perish of its misjudgment and its fantasies with open eyes. Beyond that, before a function is fully developed and mature, it constitutes a danger for the organism. And it is good if during that interval it is subjected to some tyranny. The consciousness is tyrannized, not least by our pride in it. One thinks that it constitutes the kernel of man, what is abiding, eternal, ultimate, and most original in him. On takes uh, consciousness to, for a determinate magnitude. One takes consciousness for a determinate magnitude. One denies its growth and its intermittence. One takes it for the unity of the organism. So we're basically... The, the, the thesis here is basically that consciousness is, you know, the top of the iceberg. We have unconsciousness galore below, but that is the part that really we can um, talk about and that we're obliged to talk about because it is the part that we really need to still develop. It's not like our, ability, our gag reflex that we don't need to talk about. Okay, so this is another uh, caricature to say this kind of 50s uh, computer with a lot of lights and it says, I'll be damned, it says cogito ergo sum. I 
think, therefore I am. So this is like, you know, this is kind of taking the, the idea to, to the absurdity. So why do we have consciousness? Our conscious is a part of our mind that can be described using word. Okay? Words are what we use in order to communicate with each other. Therefore, consciousness and language um, are very much related to each other and to the neocortex, to the part of the cortex that uh, is basically the newest part. So is it possible that the size of the neocortex is related to the size of the group the animal lives in? In fact, there was a study by that, about that by R.I.M. Dunbar, 1992, in which he shows that um, in uh, primates, there is a very clear relationship between the fraction of the brain that is the neocortex and the size of the group in which that individual lives. So the more we need to know about each other, because the group is big and complex, the bigger we need our neocortex where we have language and where we have consciousness. So, so strong AI and consciousness. Uh, the goal of strong AI is to model the way we think. And the Turing test measures how well a computer can imitate a person through language, right? It's very much about is he part of our group or not. The test is ill-defined. Who is the judge, right? I mean, and who are the people that are taking part? One of the main goals of language is to help us identify who is in our group and who is outside our group. And so it's a very good test for that. Only when we admit computers into our groups, we will be willing to allow them to pass the Turing test. Right? But we're not going to do that, right? Because they're just computers. When autonomous computers need to collaborate, they might need language and they might need a form of consciousness. So maybe there is a reason for computers to have consciousness that is regardless of Turing test. So that brings me to a different approach to thinking about the problem. This is an approach started in the 50s by um, Ashby, Minkler, and Engel Engelbart, is I think the most famous, which is called intelligence amplification. So the idea is we're not here to compete with a human. We're here to enhance the abilities of the human. It was coined in the 50s by people that come from cybernetics and computer pioneers. And um, this is the definition. Um, it's a transdisciplinary approach to exploring regulatory system. Cybernetics is relevant to the study of systems such as mechanical, physical, biological, cognitive, and social. Okay, so that's very much the approach of cybernetics that you talk about, that you talk about systems and how different parts of the system interact. It has a lot to do with what now done in signal processing and control and in stability in the face of disturbances, right? So, so basically a lot of cybernetics is about you have a system, it is in some kind of stable uh, state that it's functioning and then there are disturbances coming in that push it out of that and it has to figure a way to get back to homo homeostasis. So one of uh, my heroes in this direction is um, Mark Reibert, uh, who wrote uh, this book in 1986, Legged Robots That Balance, um, he was, um, he, he started the leg, leg lab first in CMU and then in MIT, and then he left and he started a company called uh, Boston Dynamics. So this is what Boston Dynamics is doing today. Uh, is, there, is there audio here? It no, doesn't matter. It's not, there's not much audio. Basically, this is... Uh, did you see that? This is just absolutely amazing. It basically, somebody pushes this legged robot to the side and it manages to figure out how to keep itself upright. Here's another time that it basically is falling on ice and it's figuring out how to get back up. I mean, in my feeling, this is alive. I'm 
unfortunately, a lot of this work, I mean, you can find videos of it, but you can't find uh, papers because it, Boston Dynamics is mostly working with DARPA. So I would say that Big Dog is one of the big achievements of modern cybernetics. Um, here's another great achievement. This is a work by our own Serge Belongi uh, that is done with the Cornell uh, Lab of uh, um, Ornithology, which is basically to identify birds. Okay, so the Visibedia is a wider thing, but this is the, the main thing that caught on. And it's looking at different problems. Uh, here is, um, sorry, I have to stay here. Um, do I have a laser? Oh yeah. Okay. So um, okay. So basically, uh, it's an e it's an easy thing for a human to say if this is a chair or an airplane. It's an easy thing for a human to say whether this has a yellow belly or a blue belly. But it's a hard thing for a human to say whether this is a finch or a, or a bunting. Most human, I mean, the experts can. So here is the type of thing that, that uh, tasks that they gave people to do in order to improve, to collect basically data in order to train machine learning algorithms. Um, can you uh, identify the indigo bantang? Okay, so here are two examples, like one of the indigo, one of the blue grosbeak, and here are pictures from nature and basically you need to decide which one uh, you think is the indigo bunting. Okay? So it's not a trivial task. Uh, the nice thing about this task is that there are many, many people eager to do it. As uh, Serge told me, uh, the only, the only um, reward that people that do this want is to see another picture of a bird. So. Here is an interesting thing. Here is the computer basically evaluating different people. Okay, so different people have different accuracy for um, a different uh, rate of error, correct rejection, and uh, rate of correct detection. Each point is a person. And you can actually very reasonably partition people into different quality that they can do this. Okay? 6% error, 15% error, and so on. So here you have the competent people. Here we have the bots. Here we have the optimists that think that everything is a bunting. Here we have the pessimists that think nothing is a bunting. And here we have Bart <laughs> that knows what it is and says the opposite. So, um, so you see what is really happening here. It's the computer classifying the people. So, yes, people are intelligent, and we can measure how much. Here is another thing that is uh, interesting in this. You can, by collaborating between the, the computer vision, machine learning, and, um, and people, um, you can design those kind of questions that, the, that will give you the most information from the human. So here is a question where uh, what you're asked to do is not identify it, but just draw a square around it, okay? And then there's also back-offs, like if the bird is truncated or occluded, or there's more than one bird, or there's no bird, okay? So you can give the other answers and basically uh, uh, provide the information this way. And when you have thousands of people doing this, you're getting very, very rich information from which you can um, develop other things. Here's another one. Here's uh, what shape is the beak. And here there are the different shapes of the beaks. And it's nice here that you can say go back, or you can say I'm, I'm just guessing, probably or definitely. So you can say how sure you are. And then we can judge whether when you're sure you're right. OK, and here is the color of the wings of the bird, and so on. Okay, so, so basically what, what I wanted to say with this example, I see, I see it as a prime example of basically intelligence enhancement, uh, amplification. Basically, it's the people that have the knowledge to various levels. The computer system is basically to combine this knowledge, feed it from one person to another, 
and then maybe automate pieces of it once you get enough da statistical data that you can create a reliable detector or classifier. So it's really a collaborative effort. Um, here is another famous one, the Google Translate. And this, here I'm basically referring to Peter Norvig made this, uh, gave a talk about, who works in Google, gave the talk about um, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. So basically people said, no, enough data will never get you to artificial intelligence because it's just data. But it turns out that if you have a lot of data, it's very hard to distinguish between this and artificial intelligence. So what I tried to do uh, with Google Translate is I'm native speaker of Hebrew, so I wanted to see how well it can translate idioms, not things that are just one-to-one -one translation, hard things to translate. So here are the initial uh, ones. Here are the set of ones that did not work very well. So basically here is, that was a piece of cake, and in Hebrew it says, well, this is a piece of a cake, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and taste of your own medicine, the, uh, same thing, and baker's dozen translates actually to 12 bakers, <laughs> and uh, backseat driver is just translated to the seat in the back driver. So not very useful. However, on the other hand, these really amazed me because here are very common things that have nothing, you know, that basically are idioms. So what's up? What's up? There's no direct translation to what's up in Hebrew, but there is basically what is happening. And so it says what is happening. Between a rock and a hard place, it says between a hammer and an anvil. That's actually the way you say it in Hebrew. Back to square one, ba I'm back to the starting point. Apple of his eye, bavat eno, which is the Exact, it's the correct expression, but it's not a direct translation. Then there was another weird one that, that I said, apple of my eye, and it translated it to something that is just, it's a, some kind of strange mix. It's like apple, apple of her eye, mine, something. So, so clearly, you know, you can, if you basically look at these translations, it's not hard to know that this is a computer. If this was as a Turing test, immediately I know that this is a computer because it makes the kind of mistakes that, that only a computer would make. Okay, so uh, that's, in terms of Turing, it's useless. But in terms of actually using it, I mean, we use it a lot. We, we use it for translating to Spanish and translating into Hebrew and all kinds of things. So I want to finish with uh, basically, um, one of the directions that I'm very interested in, and I think that there is a lot of possibility to, to, to advance there, and that is what I call, in general, intelligent monitoring. And there's a rapidly growing set of applications. So one of them is optimizing computer configuration or data centers, right? So those are things that Yes, there are IT people that are experts and they work there, but there's so many details, there's so much going on that um, if, you, if you had um, adaptive, um, intelligent uh, systems to do it, I think it would be a success. Uh, structural health, these things are already done. Like, uh, um, I know that uh, General Electric is, is using it for measuring the, for checking the health of airplane uh, engines uh, and bridges are being checked. Uh, power distribution, the smart grid. And maybe something that is, I separated it a little bit just because I think it's very important, but it is, I would like to have a little gap. Um, that's elderly living alone. I think that this is one of the problems that, that, that is growing very much in the United States and in other developed countries that, that basically we have a huge population that is getting older um, and especially those that um, because a spouse died have to live alone. Um, it's a very, very hard situation to deal with because uh, not all people can have uh, 24 hours a day uh, nurse um, and so if you could do monitoring that is not intrusive that basically just tells the nurse, you know, no reason to come in today, no reason to come in today, 
that could be a very uh, useful thing. So what is the computer task in these things? You want to model the normal behavior, and that's where machine learning and statistics come in, that you want to identify what is normal fluctuation, what is uh, fluctuations that are too big. And when you detect a significant deviation from normal, you alert the person. And uh, yeah, so if you detect it significant, you either react if it's something you can do or call a person. Okay, I'd like to summarize. So I want to argue the Turing test is more about human ability to detect the foreign than about the capabilities of the computer. Right? It's, a, it's more about us basically kind of seeing the computer as something that is a threat to us. And sometimes it is a threat. Sometimes, basically, people lose their jobs because of computers. Um, the goal of intelligence amplification is to develop a symbiosis bef between man and machine. And I don't mean things like embedded work. It's just basically that machines are good for some things, and people are good for some things, and especially the people have the responsibility. Large amounts of data can sometimes solve problems that sophisticated tools can't. So if you can collect a lot of good data, that takes you a long way. And uh, there is significant resistance to the entry of computers into these new lines of work, such as medicine. But uh, the next generation of people uh, does not know of a world without computers. So for them, I think the question is mute. OK, thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Let's see if this can be good. So uh, first question reads, <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on the theory of singularity? Right. So I think the theory of singularity is similar to Searle's uh, um, um, paradox, you know, Chinese room paradox. It's saying that once we reach some stage, let's say once computers get to this unimaginable intelligent thing, then there would be an explosion of some kind that everything will, the rules of the game will change. And um, I don't think that the rules of the game are set by computers. I mean, I think that the rules of the game are set by forces of nature, forces of people, forces of many different things. And computers are not, intelligent or not, are not going to change the, change the rules of the game. Any other questions from the audience? You don't have to submit it through the form if anyone just thought of something. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.